It is now with great pleasure I introduce our guest commencement speaker, the ultimate societal engineer. Hold on to your hats as I introduce Dr. Bob Langer. Tomorrow, in fact, Dr. Langer will be awarded an honorary Doctor of Science degree from Boston University. Dr. Langer is the David H. Koch Institute Professor at MIT. There are 14 Institute Professors at MIT. Being an Institute Professor is the highest honor that could be awarded to any faculty member at MIT. He has written approximately 1,200 articles, which have been cited over 80,000 times. The index, his index of citation is the highest of any engineer in history. He has 815 issued or pending patents worldwide. And his patents have licensed or sublicensed, been sublicensed to over 250 companies. He has served as chairman of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration's Science Board, its highest advisory board, from 1999 to 2002. His more than 200 awards include both the United States National Medal of Science and the United States National Medal of Technology and Innovation, the Charles Stock Draper Prize, considered the Engineering Nobel Prize, Albany Medical Center Prize, largest U.S. medical prize, the, World, the Wolf Prize for Chemistry, the Millennium Technology Prize, the Priestley Medal, which is the highest award for the American Chemical Society, and the Lemelson MIT Prize for being one of history's most prolific inventors in medicine. He holds 20 honorary doctorates. Dr. Langer is one of the very few individuals ever elected to the Institute of Medicine, the National Academy of Engineering, and the National Academy of Sciences. And in his spare time, he answers emails faster than anyone I've ever met in my life. <laughs> Please join me. It's an honor to hear Dr. Bob Langer. Thank you so much. I'm really delighted to be here, and I want to congratulate all of you and, and your parents. And, you know, as I listened to Eric speak, I thought about uh, what messages do we want to, do I want to leave you with? You know, and as I think about my own life when I was your age, let me give you three, and I'll try to illustrate that. So first, I think it's really important, as you think about what you want to do next, to follow your passion. You know, choose a job or whatever it is that you do because you love it, not because of money or for any other reason. Secondly, try to dream big dreams, dreams that can change the world and make it a better place. And third, and of course, we all observe this as we go through life, that a lot of times those dreams have their ups and downs. And if things start to look bad, no matter how bad they look, don't give up. So if I, if I just uh, use myself as an example, I'll just tell you a little bit about my life. When I went to college, I just really wasn't sure what I wanted to do at all. In fact, uh, just as Eric mentioned, you know, in high school, uh, the only, actually the only things I was good at was math and science. So my guidance counselor and my dad said, well, you should become an engineer. And I really couldn't quite understand that because I thought engineers ran railroad cars. I, I really did. And I couldn't see why math and science was going to be that helpful. But I, I did decide to try engineering. And actually, my first year, the only course I was really good at was chemistry. So I became a chemical engineer. But I ran into the same problem again. When I finished college, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I, I went to graduate school. And I went to graduate school for four years. And, and when I finished, uh, I still didn't know what I wanted to do. But all my classmates, this was back in the 70s, and, and uh, what happened in the 70s, just like a few years ago, is there was this gas shortage. So what happened is not only the price at the gas stations keep going up, but then it was even worse. If you had a car in Boston, you actually had to wait in line for two hours to get your tank filled up. But the consequence of that is that if you were a chemical engineer, you got a lot of job offers. And pretty much all my classmates, that's what they did. They just went to oil companies. And actually, I thought I should do that, too. I got about 20 job offers, four actually from Exxon alone. But, but one of the ones made a real impact on me. I remember going to Exxon in uh, Louisiana, and one of the older engineers said to me, if you could just increase the yield of this uh, one chemical by like 0.1%, he said, that would be wonderful. It would be worth billions of dollars. 
But I remember flying home to Boston that night thinking to myself that, that I really didn't want to do that. It just seemed boring and unimportant. So what I did want to do, and I didn't really have it very defined at the time, but I, wanted to, I had this dream of using my engineering education to help improve people's lives. In fact, when I was in uh, college, I'd spent a lot of time helping start a school for poor kids and developing new chemistry and math curricula. And one day I saw an ad, actually at City College of New York, to do just that, to develop new curricula as an assistant professor. So I wrote them a letter applying for the job, but they uh, didn't write me back. But I really liked the idea, so I found all the ads like that I could. I found about 40, and I wrote about 40 letters to different colleges applying for jobs like this, and actually none of them wrote me back. <laughs> so I started to think, what other ways can I use my background to help people? I thought about medicine. And so I wrote to a lot of hospitals and medical schools, and they uh, didn't write back either. And then one day, one of the people in the lab where I was working said to me I should, that there's a person named Judah Folkman at Harvard Medical School that I should write to. He said sometimes he hires unusual people. <laughs> he thought very highly of Dr. Folkman. I won't say what he thought about me. So, so I, I took at the time what seemed like a huge risk to an engineer, and I began doing work at a hospital. Now, that might seem a little more common today, but back in the 70s, uh, th that really hadn't been done. And I was actually the only engineer in the entire hospital. It also paid a, a much lower salary than Exxon or any other company. Projects I began working on involved creating new plastics to deliver molecules like anti-cancer molecules and others for a long time, and particularly large molecules. And no one had ever done that before. And not only that, there was a whole lot of literature saying that you couldn't do it. I actually didn't read that literature, <laughs> so I went ahead and figured out a way to do it anyhow. Um, but uh, it, I, it wasn't easy. I actually, in the lab, I actually found over 200 ways, 200 different ways to get it to not work. But eventually, I, I was able to figure out a method to, to give it to work. And, and, and I still remember to this day, you know, about two years after I did this, I got asked to give this lecture. Uh, that's one of the things you do in academics, you give a lot of lectures, to a distinguished audience of, 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 of plastic scientists and engineers in Michigan. And actually, the only talk I'd ever given before that was in eighth grade. And that talk didn't go real well. I, I still remember, it was a minute and a half speech, and so I, I wrote it out and I practiced it in front of my mirror, uh, my parents' mirror for about uh, four hours the night before. And finally, I got up in front of my eighth grade class the next day, I gave the lecture. And actually, for the first minute, I recited it pretty well. But then I could not remember the next word. And I stood up in front of my eighth grade class, just frozen for the next minute, and said absolutely nothing until my eighth grade teacher told me to sit down and gave me a not particularly good grade. I, I think it was an F. By the way, I'm gonna try to not do that this morning to you. But anyhow, now when this Michigan talk came uh, you know, up many years later, I was really nervous. I stopped working about two weeks in advance of the talk. I kept practicing to tape recorders. And finally, I got up when the day came and I gave that talk. And so that was 1976. You know, I was a lot younger then. I had more hair and things like that. You know, and, and actually, at the end of the talk, this time I felt I did all right. I didn't forget too much of it. I didn't stammer too much. So I thought when I was done with this talk that the elder engineers in the audience uh, would want to encourage me, this young guy. But when I got done, a whole bunch of people came up to me and they said, we don't believe anything you just said. <laughs> you know, it was kind of, uh, they just said you can't get these molecules through uh, the, the plastics. And also it got worse after, shortly after that talk, I, you know, as a professor, you have to try to receive grant money to do your work. I wrote all kinds of grants. My first nine were rejected. Also, I got a faculty job, actually, at MIT, but one of the bad things that happened to me was the year after I came, the, the department chairman who hired me left, so, they had, so several senior faculty decided to give me advice, and, and their advice was that I should start looking for a new job. <laughs> so there I was, getting my grants turned down, people not believing in my research, and having little hope of keeping my own job, and it wasn't you know, a very high-level job. But what, what happened was, within a couple of years, scientists in the pharmaceutical industry started using some of the principles and some of the inventions I've made, and then things started to turn around slowly, and I actually even got promoted at MIT. 
Um, today, as was mentioned, there's over 250 companies, a number of which myself and my students have started myself that are using our patents. They've created something like over 60 different types of products and are improving and in some cases saving people's lives. So that's been very rewarding to me. And, 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 and really, I guess the message that I want to come back to, to just circle back to the very beginning, is to simply say that when you graduate from college, the path you follow is often confusing, it's often unclear, and sometimes it's actually scary. Certainly was for me. But I hope you'll choose something to do that you really love and that you'll also dream big about how you can do things that'll help people and improve the world. And there may be times when you try to do something in engineering or when you try to invent something where people will tell you that it's impossible or that it'll never work. But I think that's very rarely true. I think that if you really believe in yourself, if you really work hard, stick to things, and persevere, there's very little that's truly impossible. I want to wish all of you the best in your future. Congratulations. <laughs>